لما يا مخلوق آثرت الجحود كنت معدوما فمن أين الوجود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود قبله في الكون من بعده الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه وأهل بيته وأزواجه وذريته أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن الكريم والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خص إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه صدق الله وصدق الرسول ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين أما بعد In the last classes that you all attended you all will have begun Surah Al-Zumar and Surah Al-Zumar in the very introduction of the Surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he highlights three amazing things one of them you all dealt with, which is Tanzil al-Qur'an, the revelation, the descent of the Qur'an, that was the very first ayah. And thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's the opening of the surah, as he cracks it open, he then talks about two other important aspects that is directly related to the prosperity of human beings. That is, the tawheed and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the repulsive attitude against shirk and polytheism. And today, inshallah, we hope to explore this whole aspect of shirk a little bit and the aspect of sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our beliefs and in our actions. So inshallah, we shall explore those. In Surah 3, in verse 3 of Surah Al-Zumar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Surely the religion is for Allah only. And those who take awliya, protectors and helpers besides him, see, we worship them only that they may bring us near to Allah. Verily, Allah will judge between them concerning that therein they defer, wherein they defer. Truly, Allah guides not him who is a liar and a disbeliever. The first part of the above verse re-establishes the injunction of being sincere to Allah in one religious actions. And ikhlas and sincerity is one of the most amazing aspects of a human being's life. For we as Muslims, we believe that there will be a day of judgment. And on this day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's not going to look at kathara, He's not going to look at plentifulness of deeds. But Allah is going to look at the quality of those deeds that are there. So much so. Great actions that people will do in this world, if they aren't done excellently, Allah will throw them in hell. One tradition of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, that on the day of judgment, a martyr will come before Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him, so why did you become a martyr? And he will extol and he will say, that I fought in your part to uplift the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to uplift your religion. And this is a martyr, a person who puts his life on the line for religion. And yet still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell him on this day of judgment that no, you lie. That you only did that so that people will call you a brave person. So that you will be remembered for your bravery. And then Allah will order the angels, you get down in hell, pelt him into hell. Second person will be brought before Allah, an alim. So much virtues they are for seeking knowledge. Yet still, Allah will ask him, Why did you seek knowledge? And he will tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will tell him, You're lying. The objective of you coming to seek ilm was so that people will have known you as a real knowledgeable person. Everybody knows you as a big scholar around. You never did it for the sake of Allah. And this is ilm, this is knowledge we are speaking about. And Allah will say, No, head long into hell. And the third individual, you'll come before Allah, you'll be a really wealthy person. And so much of fadilat and so much of virtues for giving charity, spending, excellent. Allah talks about it in the Holy Quran. 
In the month of Ramadan, something so encouraged, spend and you're going to get all of these thawab and all of these rewards. And yet still, on the day of Qiyamah, when Allah will ask this person, so why did you give so much? He will tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will tell him, no, you're lying. The only reason you did that so that everybody will know you're the generous guy. You're the most, the person who is to give plenty. And again, Allah will tell the malaika and then the angels, throw him headlong into Jahannam. Therefore, our deen and our religion, despite how great and magnificent an amal may be, without this first quality of being sincere to Allah, it works nothing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It works zero. The great Umar of the Allah ta'ala, and he used to say, he used to say, Nahnu nahkumu. He said, we used to judge with zahir. We judge by the apparent. We see a guy praying salah. Person reading Quran, Zikr. In our hearts and our minds, we have nothing bad to say except that he's pious and righteous. He is excellent and he's good. He's living a great life. He's a real excellent Muslim. So Umar of the Allah Talan says, We are weak. We judge on the apparent, those things that we see. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yatawalla sarair. Allah, He judged by the inside. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at things that are way deeper than that. So Allah doesn't look at kathara, Allah doesn't look at plentifulness, but Allah looks at quality. And one major part of that quality is ikhlas and its sincerity. So he says, surely the religion is for Allah only. This first part of the above verse re-establishes the injunction of being sincere to Allah in one's religious actions. It also explains that the teaching of doing worship for Allah's sake only, as mentioned in the verse 2, is an account of the fact that deen and religion belongs to Allah alone. Allah is the owner of the deen and religion, and every religious deed belongs to Him. So if deen is owned by Allah, Allah wants that every single thing religious you do be done only for Him and nobody else. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day, tradition from Shaddad ibn Awsa radiallahu ta'ala, he said the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he explained to them and he told them that beware of this secret shirk, this secret type of polytheism that exists. And they explain, they ex they say, oh, Nabi of Allah, you go on, you explain, tell us about this secret thing. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said, sometimes a person, he prays, he fasts, and he gives charity. And the only reason he has done those actions is outwardly he is doing it, but inside he wants everybody to know that he is a real generous person. He is a person who is actually performing quite a lot of salat. Another tradition that is similar to that is from Abu Sayyid al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala. He says, one day we were sitting, and we were talking about the Dajjal and the fitness of the Dajjal. And one of the fitness of the Dajjal is, he's going to try to convince people away from the fold of Islam. And then the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered upon them. And then he said to them, you know something that I fear for you more than the fitna of the Dajjal? He says, I fear for you more that secret shirk, you doing things for sure. Commentators explain why is the Nabi of Allah saying to the Sahaba that I fear this thing that is called doing things for sure more than your fitna of the Dajjal. Commentators explain the people who are mukhlisin, the people who are believers, highly unlikely will they ever go and worship a stone just like that. Highly unlikely will they just leave the religion and just go and worship something else. Highly unlikely. But the minor shirk and doing things for sure. That comes in subtly. That comes in really, really easily, and you don't even recognize that it's there. So the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to them, I fear this. I really fear this more than even the fitness of the Dajjal for you. Another tradition that comes from Muhammad ibn Labib, he said, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the thing that I fear most for my ummah, of all the things that are there, you have fornication, you have consumption of alcohol. You have so many things. But from all of them, the thing that I fear most for them, again, is this minor shirk that's there. This secret shirk that exists within, 
which is riya and doing things for show. You're showing off. And there are some people, they do quite a lot of ibadah. And they don't tell any about, about their ibadah, but within their heart, they want people to know that they do these things. They don't tell anybody. They get up for their tahajjud and they read their Quran and every single thing. They don't tell anybody. But within their call, they wish that everybody knew that they used to get up for tahajjud. And they will read Quran and they will do their zikr and they do this and they do that. That's that secretness that's inside of there. So therefore, it's for fame. It's not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the commentary, it explains that ibadat in general belongs to Allah. And Allah wants that every single worship or act of worship you do is for me and me alone and nobody else should be a part of that. So this is real ikhlas. So therefore, how to develop this ikhlas then? Because sometimes we are in such scenarios whereby the heart changes, the condition of the heart it moves away. Allah may explain. One, before we do an amal, ask ourselves why it is I'm doing it and get back that psyche, get back that heart again for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the center of an amal, sometimes we see, you know, it's everybody shaking their heads and everybody is following and sometimes the thought comes inside, you're doing an excellent job. And now the heart moves away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at the center of your amal, check yourself again. Is it still for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if not, pull it back. Get it back there. And when it is you complete an amal, when you complete an action, again, check yourself again. Did I complete this action for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And with this conscious thought all the time now before we do every action, at the center and at the end, we'll realize that our hearts start to become more connected to Allah. It's all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No? One dua of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he used to make, he used to say, Allahumma, a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Many people know the dua. That, oh Allah, a'inni, help me. In other words, oh Allah, I can't do it by myself. I need you. I need your assistance. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika. Help me to remember you. If you don't help me, how, oh Allah, how am I going to remember you? Help me to remember you. Wa shukrika. Oh Allah, help me to be grateful to you as well. Help me to show gratitude to you. And the last one. Oh Allah, help me when it comes to husni ibadatik. Doing all of my worship to the best and epitome of excellence. You are to help me, O oh Allah. I can't, get, can't do it all by myself. So therefore, the one dua of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to help develop our ikhlas and our sincerity. Another dua of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma, O oh Allah, tahir qalbi minan nifaq. O oh Allah, purify my heart from hypocrisy. Tahir qalbi minan nifaq. Wa amali mina riya and oh Allah purify my amal and all my actions from show. From show enough. You, know, you wanna help me, oh Allah, I can't do it all by myself. So Allahumma tahir qalbi mina nifaqi. Wa amali mina riyai. Walisani mina al kidbi wala help to protect my tongue from lion. Wa aini min al khiyana and help me to protect my eyes from all those things that are wrong, low and despicable. Why? فَإِنَّكَ تَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ وَمَا تُخْفِ sudur. For you know every single action of the eye and you know everything that the heart conceals. So Allah, you ought to help me. So inshallah, if we try these one or two little things, we'll start developing sincerity because Allah wants it. As soon as he starts his Surah Zumar, he goes immediately into talking about this quality of ikhlas. He wants sincerity from every individual. We need to do those actions and every single action we do sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he continues to say, Allah is the owner of the deen, the religion. And every religious deed belongs to him. Hence, no one or thing shall be joined with him in these matters. Instead, every religious action and deed must be done purely for his sake. While commenting on the verse, surely the religion is for Allah, the exegetes have explained that Allah has notified mankind that he does not accept any action except that it is done for him alone. Since he alone possesses all the attributes of lordship and is fully aware of everything that is secret and hidden. All religious deeds and actions, therefore, 
must be free from ostentation. You cannot do anything for show. Conceit, pride, and pretension. It can be no munafik and hypocrite. Pretend to be doing anything. Every single thing must be done. Mukhlisin alahuddin. Sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These must also be done with a pure intention. Where the pleasure of none is intended except in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where a believer is now a complete believer. Whereby every single action you do is all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of our ulama have written that because we don't do things sincerely, we become annoyed, we become angry with people. And it causes more problems than anything. And if we were to really be mukhlisin and really be sincere, a lot of problems, they wouldn't exist. Some of them, they give this example. That many times within the home, we help out our spouses, etc. And the reason for helping is that we, in our minds, expect some type of return. To get some free time, to do what we want, etc. If when it is, that expectation in our minds now for that free time, whatever it is, doesn't manifest itself, what's our attitude now? I help you do this, I help you do that, I help you do X, Y, and Z, and all I wanted was this. So therefore, our doing of our amals was to get some dunya we return. So we become annoyed, we become angry, we become so many different things. Well, let me explain. If we were to just tweak our niyats and tweak our intention, and instead of doing it for some dunya we return, do it for Allah, you will get thawab and you will get rewards for those amal. And whether you get a return in this dunya or not, it will not harm you in any way. You won't feel that somebody didn't help you out, etc. So therefore, ikhlas and sincerity will help protect and preserve even conditions within the home as well. To make sure that it's all done excellently and all done good. Some of our ulama have given a few examples. Just to test and to show our ikhlas and our sincerity. And whether we are doing things for sure. Some of them are written that there are many individuals and people they are very punctual with their salat in jamaat. If ever one day you come late for salat and you are musbuk, you got to make up one rakat afterwards. If at the time of getting up the thought comes in your mind, I wonder what people get say. But use the frontline mind all the time. You come for salat and you don't miss takbir tahrima. How come you miss today? Therefore, that's a sign that you wasn't doing this whole coming early all the time for the sake of Allah. Rather, somewhere along the line, it seeped in that you wanted to do this because this has become your habit now. You wanted to be known then as a person who is always punctual for salat. So therefore, you can gauge yourself and see whether it's a little bit of riya, a little bit of show has come in there, coming early for salat all the time or not. Because whether you had reached early or a little bit late was the same Allah you are praying to. I'll give you a second example, just to gauge, just to see. When we come to masjid, we dress excellently. Nice clothes, perfume, smelling good, everything. We pray salat in masjid. If it so happens one day we are unable to pray salat in masjid, we are performing salat at home. Is the same care for salat like when we go to masjid? Do we dress appropriately? Or anyhow that we were, we just stand for salat and we pray salat anyhow. That's the days in masjid, we stand real nice and straight. But when you're home now, it's the quickest we could pray. As though in the masjid you are praying to somebody different from when you are performing salat at home. It's the same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore these are little things that we can just gauge ourselves. To work on our own selves, to get rid of that little moving away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want that every single thing be done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That ikhlas must be there. Many of our ulama have written, sometimes ikhlas is the last thing to come or the first thing to leave. Work on our amal, we work on our amal, ikhlas finally comes. And some little thing happens and is the first to leave. And sometimes people congratulate us and that causes it to go. People big us up, causes it to go. They praise us, they do all these different things and it causes it to go. So therefore we need to keep a constant check on ourselves all the time. Allah introduces ikhlas over here because he's going to talk about something really, really important. So he's heavily introducing ikhlas and sincerity 
Because you need to be sincere because what I'm going to speak about now will require your utmost sincerity. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes on to say now. After talking about ikhlas, he says in the same ayah, and those who take awliya, protectors and helpers, besides him say, we worship them only that they may bring us near to Allah. Verily, Allah will judge between them concerning that wherein they differ. So it's in the same verse, Allah starts with intention. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to talk about those individuals and people who are mushrikun and who are polytheists. So in the commentary now he says in verse 3, mention was also made of a false notion of the polytheists. About this, the verse states, those who take others as partners to Allah say, we worship them only so that they may draw us close to Allah. This was the argument of the polytheists and the mushrikeen in taking false gods and idols as the objects of worship. While commenting on this, the great exegist Qatada radiallahu ta'ala stated, When the polytheists used to be asked, Who is your Lord and your creator? And who created the heavens and the earth? And who sends water from the heavens? They used to say Allah. They will then be asked as to why they worship idols. In response, they will say, so that they may take us closer to Allah and intercede for us before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what they did was, say they are worshipping Allah and justify at the same time they are worshipping of other deities and other gods. Commentators of the Holy Quran explain, Satan's biggest trial on human beings is to get them away from Islam. To get them into shirk and into polytheism. He wants friends as well. That's like how believers want to be with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa in paradise. Satan also wants to have many people in hell. And in the Holy Quran, Allah reproduces one statement of Satan when he said, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him rajim and cursed, he made a bequest before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the very first of those bequests that he made, and he said before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he's telling Allah, La udhillannahum. That for certainly, O oh Allah, without a doubt, I want to get them out of Islam. I want to get them misguided. And that is one ploy of Satan, to get people out of Islam. Shaitan is using a ploy on these polytheists as well to get them out of Islam and to stay out of Islam. And he is using that and he is getting into their brain and he is making them think, so to say, logically. What's the logical thinking that he is given to them? Commentators explain. He is putting in their minds that when you have a king, Nobody can just walk up to a king just like that and have a conversation with him. You can't just barge into his office. In order for that to happen and that to take place, there are procedures. You need to meet the person on the outside. Permission must be granted. If permission is granted, then you can enter. And if no permission is granted, he might take your message and bring back an answer, but you might not get face-to-face -face meeting with him. So therefore, shaitan puts the same thinking in their minds. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is malikul mulk, he is the king of all kings. You can't go to Allah directly, therefore you need to use some medium to reach Allah. So shaitan puts in their minds, what can we use to reach Allah? All these other gods that we have, use them, they will intercede before Allah, just like how people and Kings will have their secretaries and their courtiers as intercessors between the people and them. They are the buffer. So therefore, they are saying and they are justifying to themselves. On one hand, we worship Allah, which is Tawheed and monotheism. And this thing that you are talking about, us committing shirk, we ain't committing no shirk. These are just like when you have courtiers and people who come and worship and carry a message to Allah. So this is just like that. So commentators explain, this is the statement of these polytheists. They are saying, whenever they are asked and whenever they are questioned, do you worship Allah? They are saying yes. So if you were to be asked, who is your king? They are saying, Allah, this is my king. And at the same time, 
So why then do you worship and why then do you go to all of these gods? Because these gods are our intermediaries between Allah. You can't just go to a king just like that. There's a process. So therefore, shaitan puts in their mind this process and justifies it to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't like that at all. Because now what you are doing is, you are mixing up pure tawheed, which is Allah and Allah only, with all of these types of logical types of arguments, and Allah never condoned those. You are mixing up pure monotheism, which is Allah and Allah alone. Nothing else. And you are associating and bringing with, at the same time, all of these other deities as well. And Allah does not like that. So Allah indirectly is telling them in Isaiah, you see your justification for these gods? A day is going to come and I'll deal with you for that. A day is going to come and I'll deal with you when it comes towards these type of arguments that you are actively bringing. So this is what Qatada radiallahu ta'ala when asked, this is what he said. The, when they were asked who created the heavens, the earth and everything, Allah. So why then do you worship these gods? So that they can intercede for us before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The statement made by the polytheists showed that they turned to the idols because they believed that they will help them by interceding to Allah for their assistance, sustenance and for other worldly matters. And for the matters of the hereafter and the day of judgment, they denied these and rejected them. The notion which the polytheists had about their idols, that they turned to them only that they may make them closer to Allah for assistance and sustenance, is one which all polytheists of the past had, and it is one which the polythe polytheists of today also have. Yeah? Their justification of why they worship many gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In reply to their false notion, the Quran states, Verily, Allah shall judge between them concerning that wherein they differ. And what are they differing? You have the mu'minun and the believers are saying, Monotheism, Allah and Allah, only no 360 gods. They are saying, Allah, but help us with 360 gods. Allah says, are these going to come? I will sort you guys out. I will sort out who is actually an haq and I will sort out actually who is upon batil. So the notion which a polytheist had, you know, in reply to the false notion, the Quran says, Verily Allah shall judge between them concerning that wherein they differ. The verse explains that on the day of judgment. Allah will judge between the creation in what they differed about regarding the matters of religion. This whole aspect of oneness of Allah and non-oneness of Allah. He will then give to each person what he deserves. What is that? As for the believers who believed in Allah and worshipped Him alone, they will be sent to paradise. As for those unbelievers and polytheists who associated partners with Allah and worship others besides Allah, they shall be thrown into the blazing fire of hell. Well, let me explain. Whenever prophets came, they are the best da'is that ever stepped foot on the face of the earth, inviters to Allah. Their mannerism, their charisma, their determination, their patience, the way that they will deal with their calm and deal with their people, Satan recognized that this was actually having an impact on the hearts. And therefore, he needed to create different ploys to keep them out of totally entering into this Islam. And this is one of the many ploys that he has put into the hearts of people to get them not entering fully into the face of Islam. Or being monotheists and being people who are worshippers of Allah and Allah only. And shaitan is very, very intelligent. So in their minds, the hearts of the polytheists, they think they are upon Tawheed, they think they are upon oneness. Because if they were to be asked, as the Quran rightly says, how many gods are there? One. So in their minds, they are monotheists. But Allah says that's not pure monotheism. Pure monotheism is when there is Allah and nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? So therefore, these, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is refuting. If you have pure ikhlas and pure sincerity in Allah and you are doing things for Allah and Allah only, you will never share that with any other idol. You will never share that with any other God. So Allah is establishing, if you become really mukhlisin, really sincere, 
and religion is only for Allah, where will the concept of any other intermediary ever come from? The reason that these intermediaries are coming is because you lack the first quality in the ayat, which is pure ikhlas, which is pure sincerity. Hence, Allah opens the ayat with sincerity before he gets into this. It's because of your lack of sincerity, all of these other aspects are actually entering and actually coming in. Verse 3 concludes with the statement, truly, Allah does not guide the one who is a liar and a disbeliever. It means that Allah does not grant divine aid towards guidance, nor does he lead to the religion of truth, those who invent and fabricate lies against him, and those who reject and deny him. Okay. There are two types of guidance. One type of guidance is idaratu tariq, whereby you show, you indicate, you tell somebody about the right path. That's one type of guidance. So therefore a person comes for directions and you tell him, Go proceed, turn right. When you see this building, turn left. So all you are doing to him is telling him. If he follows it, mashallah. But if he doesn't follow your direction, he could end up somewhere totally different. One thing that is there is called idaratu tariq. To just indicate to direct people towards the pathway. Another way, another type of hidayat, another type of guidance is Isal ila al Whereby you say, Come sit in my vehicle, let me carry you to the destination. Where it is you take the person and you carry them all the way to exactly where it is they have to go. The first one, we can do that to everybody. That's within our domain, our control. We can direct the path of Hidayah to everybody, to mankind. Even the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he directed. But the second one which is to take somebody and make them a Muslim, that is with Allah and Allah only. That is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can educate, you can show. You can be as coercive as possible. You can be as charismatic with regards to your words and try to show somebody the haq and the truth. All you are doing is directing. But really taking them there, that is in Allah's hands alone. Had we possessed the second one, well, everybody would have been Muslim. Everybody from the family of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have been Muslim. So therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, He says truly, Allah guides not him who is a liar and a disbeliever. There are some people now, when you give them directions and you tell them, they tell you, I ain't believing nothing that you say. I don't want to hear you. You don't even want the guidance at all. And if you don't even want me to tell you anything and you don't want the guidance at all, where, how come you will ever reach your destination? You'll never, ever, ever be able to because you're even willing to accept, to hear, and do a sima of kabul. That's the openly listen. You're not even willing to do that. So Allah says these people who, when the message comes to them, they are that pig-headed. They are telling the Rasul. They are telling people in general who tells them about Islam. I don't want to hear nothing about it. They are unwilling to just listen with a listening of openness. You don't have to believe us yet. Just listen with an open mind. And as prayer to God that let me see the haq, let me see the truth in whatever is being said. Those individuals, inshallah, guidance will come to them. Allah will guide them. But if you're obstinate, pig-headed from the very beginning, and you yourself shut out your heart, you're never ever going to be guided. So Allah says, Allah guides not him who is a liar and a disbeliever. And this is their attitude. They don't want to listen. They don't want to hear. They don't want to have anything to do with an openness at all. So therefore he says, it means that Allah does not grind, divine, grant divine aid towards guidance, which is isal ilal matulub. Allah doesn't take a person to pure hidayat and guidance, nor does he lead to the religion of truth. Those who invent and fabricate lies against him and those who reject and deny him, they, out, they just have this stubbornness to deny Allah. Allah says, the hidayat, very, very unlikely hidayat is ever, ever going to come to that individual. Two things Allah highlights in this one verse. So one verse highlights so much. Ikhlas and sincerity. If you have ikhlas, 
Monotheism will always be there. But when Ikhlas starts to win, we'll start to firstly do things for other than Allah. You'll start to have that secret shirk, you'll start doing things for sure. And if it is, our ikhlas starts to decline and decline and decline, then you people will become just like these polytheists of Arabia, and then they will inculcate within their teachings and their own practices all of these types of idol worship, etc. And all of these things will eventually come in. So the first thing is a lot of ikhlas. Sincerity prevents from all of these different things. Allah then goes on to highlight another aspect of these polytheists. When he says, having refuted the ideology of the polytheists in the above verse, Surah Zumar goes further in verse 4 to condemn the statement of those who say that Allah has children. The verse states, had Allah willed to take a son or offspring or children, he could have chosen whom he pleased out of those whom he created. But glory be to him. He is above such things. He is Allah, the one, the irresistible. The verse condemns the statement of the pagans of Mecca who said that the angels were the daughters of Allah. That's the first thing. They said that the angels, they are banatullah, they are the daughters of Allah. But look how ironic their statements are. You all will know that the Arabs, whenever they were to get girl children, and that will be their firstborn, it's a girl child. They used to consider that as an embarrassment. They used to consider that as something really, really heinous and bad. So much so that they will bury them alive. They will kill their girl children. On the day of Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is going to ask these children, what sin did you do for these people to kill you? What sin did you commit as a little kid, a little baby, that your parents buried you alive? And it will be not a question that requires an answer, but it will be as a means of chastisement to these parents. You've got to cough up an answer before Allah that will, make, that will have some sort of sense. So they will bury their girl children because they didn't like daughters at all. They didn't like that. So this is the Arabs and this is their behavior. Allah is the supreme. Why then will he want to choose daughters as his children? Don't you think that will be utter foolish for a God to choose daughters? This is just hypothetically. When you or human beings hate daughters and consider them inferior, why will I, Allah, who is the most majestic, choose daughters for? That is stupid. That is irrational. I will definitely choose sons. So even your claim of me taking daughters is foolish. Because why will you choose, why are you all choosing daughters, choosing sons for yourself and you are burying your daughters? I would have chosen sons as well and not daughters. So therefore the first one. But this is what they did. Who said the angels were the, the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It also condemns the belief held by the Jews who said that Uzair was the son of Allah and denounces the Christians who said that Jesus was the son of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A child normally comes from the same genus as his parents and he also has qualities of his father and qualities of his parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the khaliq and he is the creator. Every other thing besides Allah is created. Every single thing you can think about is created. Jannah is created, Jahannam is created. Jibreel is created, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is created. Every single thing other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all created. So therefore if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he were to have a son as they claim, Uzair the Jews, Jesus the Christians, it will mean that Allah who is the creator is having a child who is created. And therefore that doesn't make sense. Because the created and the creator is not from the same genus. They are not from the same species. They are totally, totally different. So therefore logically that doesn't even make sense at all. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have a child. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have any children at all. That does not make any sense. Because it will mean that they are also creators. But they are created. 
So therefore, it will not make any type of logical sense at all. But Allah says, for them, they justify that Allah has these kids and Allah has these children. Those who held such beliefs were criticized and condemned in this verse. The verse refutes such false beliefs by presenting a supposition of the impossible. And that's why. Because Allah, it's impossible for Allah to have any children, but Allah gives in for argument's sake. For argument's sake, let's say hypothetically, this were to be possible, but it's impossible. It means that having a son is one which cannot occur at all from Allah. However, hypothetically, if it is imagined that such can happen, then Allah will not have taken children from humans. Instead, he will have done so from his special creation, from whomsoever he wish. Allah in the verse, he said, if it is you to look back, had Allah willed to take a son or offspring or children, he will have chosen whom he pleased out of those who he created. So why is there the restriction on only a human being? There are so many creation of Allah that are bigger, stronger, more majestic, more amazing than a human being. So why Allah had to choose a human? Why did he choose those extremely great malaika? Why did he choose those extremely great angels? Those angels who are holding the throne, for instance. From one part of the limb to another part, distance of 500 years journey. That's one part of a limb. That's not even the entire malak and the entire angel. Why didn't Allah choose those creation? Some creation, they came to the face of the earth only once, never ever again. Why did Allah choose the Barak? So far, so lightning. Such an amazing creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why the restriction for? He continues to say. This, however, is impossible and impractical as I have explained. Allah is pure and free from the qualities of the creation. And what's the quality of the creation? To give birth. That's the quality of makhluk and a quality of creation. And these qualities of the creation, they are not qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has no need for children. Like human beings, there is a need for children. Some people, they think, when I get old, these are my kiddos. They will help me out. They will eat me. If when I die, they will bury me. They will do all of these things. My children will carry on my business. They will do all of these different things. So people have children for many different objectives and many different purposes. If we say that Allah has children, what was the need for Allah to have children? And if there is a need for Allah to have children, it will mean that Allah suffers a bit of weakness. To be in need means that you are weak. There is something that is lacking in you. You can't do it by yourself. Hence, you require aid and assistance. So therefore, if Allah had children, it means that Allah is weak and Allah is not weak. Allah is free from every single fault and defect that exists. So he says, nor does he have a need for partners and helpers. We require assistance. Allah does not require any assistance at all. We require assistance because we cannot do it all no matter how much we try. We might think that we are independent to an extent, but we depend on everybody else for our business to function, for every single thing to happen. For every single thing to go on, we are dependent on somebody else. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not dependent on anybody. He is really and truly the only independent being that exists. So he says, He is beyond all imperfections and he and is the almighty creator of every single, everyone. The verse rejects such notions and states. Glory is to him, subhanahu Glory be to him. The word subhan in Arabic is said for many different purposes. One purpose of saying subhan is to show utter amazement. Like somebody says something really, really foolish. The Quran says subhanallah. You know, what a foolish statement. So people who, in the Quran, who said that Isa alayhi salam is the son of God and Uzair is the son of God, after certain places in the Quran, Allah says subhanallah. Amazing how it is you all can say such a statement. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has no children, etc. Another reason of saying subhan is to, so, is to show ta'ajjub, to show surprise. And how amazing it is that you all can utter such a thing. And the word subhan as well. 
Apart from just being glory be to Allah, it has a meaning that is deeper than just glory be to Allah. Because if I were to ask any one of you, what does glory be to Allah mean? That's it. What does that really mean? Glory be to Allah. But subhanallah really means Allah is that being who is free from every single imperfection. And he's totally, totally perfect. That is what subhan is. So Allah is, when they are saying that Allah has a child, Allah then says subhan. Out of either amazement or what a foolish statement they are saying. Or, and at the same time to indicate that I have zero imperfections at all. Many of our ulama have said, whenever we say subhanallah, it's also one, it has the fadilat of. A tree is planted for us in Jannah. Every subhanallah, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says a tree is planted. And secondly, every subhanallah that we utter, it's also a dua indirectly. What's a dua? That, oh Allah, you are perfect. You have no blemishes. You have no defect. You have zero weakness. You have no fault. You have no needs. You is Allah. I, on the other hand, have every weakness, all the faults, all the blemishes, all the weakness, all the needs. Oh Allah, help me to overcome. Help me to get rid of these weaknesses and these faults that I actually have. And let me become pure. So therefore, indirectly, subhanallah is also a dua. So can we imagine going into ruku and bowing and saying subhanallah? That, oh Allah, I have all these faults, all these weakness I have. You are that one who is all amazing. You are that one who is free from every single defect. And oh Allah, you are al-azim. You are the greatest. Imagine in Ruku you are like that now. And more sweet than that, can you imagine in Sajda? That you are before Allah and you are telling Allah that, Oh Allah, look at where I am. You are Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. You are the highest. You are the most majestic. And Oh Allah, look at where I am on the ground. Because why? I am filled with blemishes. I have faults. I have sins. I have weaknesses. Oh Allah, help me. Forgive me. Oh Allah, wipe away those faults and those sins that I have committed. In sajda, now it is sajda becomes sweet. Now ruku becomes sweet as well. Bowing before Allah. Sujood becomes sweet as well. So Allah says glory to him. He is pure from such defects. It means that Allah is free and pure from partners and children. He is Allah, the one, the irresistible. The verse explains that he is the one God. There is none but him and he is free from likes and equals. There is nobody like the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Holy Quran, Allah says, Laisa, there is not. Ka, like. Laisa ka, mithil, there is nothing like the like of Allah. And that's a kind of unique, amazing grammatical construction. There is nothing like the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When people are twins, you, know, you can still find one or two differences. I can still find certain similarities. Allah says you can put your brain to all it can and you'll never find a single thing in this entire dunya that you can compare to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is resemble Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah describes himself in the Holy Quran as al-basir, the all seeing But we have sight. But when it is we look at our sight, we can look from here to the skies thousands of miles in an instant. But our sight is so restricted that put our hands before our eyes and that's the end of sight. It can't go beyond that. Commentators trying to just give us a little insight on how amazing the sight of Allah is, they explain. Just for us to get the haqqaiq and a little reality of this Allah, that if a black ant were to be on a black rock on the darkest night, Allah is still able to see the footprints of this ant. That is just for us to understand what is basir, what is, what is, a, what is amazing sight. So we, although have little things, there is nothing like the like of Allah. There is no way to compare anything of this dunya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Allah, the one, the irresistible. The verse explains that he is the one God. There is none but him and he is free from likes and equals. Look at it. If nobody can get like Allah, you think anybody can get equal to Allah? If nobody can get like Allah, can anybody get equal to Allah? Impossible. Can't even come like him, much less equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is irresistible and overpowering. 
and is the master over his servants. While commenting on this verse, the exegetes have explained, in this verse, Allah has purified himself from having a son or children, and then described himself as being the one, the only one, because the state of being one and only negates having a son. If there was a son of Allah, he would have been from his species as well. And if his son was from the same species, then his son will have also been a creator as well. And that is impossible to have something coming from the creator and still being called a creator. He will be called a creation. So that is impossible. Something coming from the creator cannot be called a creator as well. That is creation. So therefore, it cannot be called the creator. So therefore, Allah has no son. Otherwise, he will have something from his species. But since Allah is one and only, he has no species and there can be no one from him. Allah has also described himself as being the irresistible one. He subdues and overpowers everyone and everything and none can dominate him. Nobody can dominate Allah. Many times when humanity left Allah, Allah showed humanity, I can do it and I don't need you. One glaring example to the Arabs was the protection of the Kaaba when Abraha came. Everybody left, everybody ran to the hills and everybody ran to the mountains. And Abdul Muttalib, he said, the owner of the Kaaba will protect the Kaaba. He is the Amir, he is the one in charge of the entire of Makkah, but he knew what Abraha had done. Because when Abraham left Yemen, he destroyed everybody in his path who came as an antagonist to him. And Abdul Muttalib knew very well that he couldn't have stand before Abraham. So therefore, he had to put reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, the owner of the Kaaba, let him see about the Kaaba. And therefore, in Surah Al-Quraysh, Allah told the Quraysh, فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ O Abdul Muttalib and O the entire Quraysh, you know when you all left, what did you all say? Let the owner of the Kaaba protect the Kaaba. Allah takes that same thing from them and puts it back to them. Forget all your 360 gods. Why not worship the Lord of this house? The same one who protected it when all of you all ran, that's the same one. Just worship him alone. So it's the same thing Allah brought back in Surah Quraysh for the Quraysh. So therefore Allah is the one. Nobody can overpower Allah. Nobody can subdue Allah. Allah is in charge of everybody and every single thing. These attributes, therefore, show that there is no partner for him, nor are there peers, likes, equals, or rivals for him. Since everyone and everything is under his power, control, and might, therefore, we understand so far that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing, nothing of this entire dunya can overpower Allah. Secondly, we understand that Allah is in total control of every single thing that exists. Every single thing Allah is in total control to. Therefore, what does it require us to do? The first lesson. Mukhlisina lahuddin. The first thing. Have ikhlas in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For he is the one in control of every single thing. Conditions. Allah is in charge of conditions. Connect and have ikhlas with Allah. Allah is the one to change conditions. Allah is the one to do every single thing. Sometimes our little problem is we look and we focus so hard on asbab and means and we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah wants us to put reliance on him and Allah will put hidayat in the means. So don't concentrate too much on the means on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he built in his sahaba. Learn to get that ikhlas. Learn to get Allah. And with whatever means you utilize, Allah somehow or the other always puts barakat in that. Allah puts greatness in those means that are there. So therefore, that's the first thing. Apart from that, protection of our hearts against polytheism. If it is we have ikhlas, no polytheism will come. Whether it's the major polytheism to actually go and worship stones and idols of human beings, or whether it's the minor one. As for the minor one, is either Allah do one of two things. He can forgive us for doing things for sure, 
or Allah can hold us accountable. So therefore, that's the one we got to work on to make sure that every single one of our amal, every single one of our actions is all done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in these verses, Allah goes on to refute the notions, the beliefs of these polytheists of having children. And we explain why Allah can have no children. Why it is, it's stupid for Allah to have daughters. How is it impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have children? And he ends the verse really, really nicely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A glory be to Allah. Allah is free from every single blemish, defect. Whatever you want to ascribe to Allah, Allah is free. Qul huwallahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Allah, he is Allah, the one, the irresistible. Understand, O Quraysh and O humanity at large, you cannot overpower Allah, you cannot overcome Allah, you cannot overthrow Allah. Allah is in control. Allah is the one to do every single thing. And within these verses as well, Allah also gives us a bit of insight that when it comes towards kufr and it comes to disbelief, if you have an open mind, inshallah, hidayat will come your way. But if you are pig-headed and obstinate and you don't want to listen at all, Allah says, I will not bring you and I will not carry you towards the hidayat and I will not carry you towards the guidance. So therefore, these are a few things that we learn within these two ayats, only two ayats we commented on briefly today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the understanding of his book. May Allah grant us true ikhlas and sincerity. May Allah protect us from doing things for show. May Allah protect us from shirk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Make us firm believers in Tawheed and the oneness of Allah. May Allah grant us that Tawfiq and that ability to recognize how it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure. May us never ever have doubts concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the Quran to purify our hearts from whatever rust there may be. May our hearts become burnished and bright. May Allah accept you. May Allah accept me. May Allah accept Unite us in this world. May Allah unite us in the hereafter. Wa akhir dawana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Continue next week insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum. Liyya dunya nas bata'sa كل يوم على بعضها ليه دنيا الناس بتنسى